Science in Human Origins, Objections, Part 1. We've been going through the book Science and Human Origins uh, by Gauger, Axe, and Luskin, published by the, the, the Discovery Institute Press. And uh, we've gone through all the chapters and what they have to say, and now we're going to broaden our uh, view to look at what other people have to say about them. Now, you may remember that the first two chapters are by Ann Gauger and uh, Douglas Axe, um, and they're very closely related to each other, and uh, so we're going to consider them together. We will probably not have time for anything more, but uh, we will see. Uh, that is today, and then uh, we'll come back probably with chapter uh, three, four, and five eventually, and we'll uh, consider the objections there. Um, just for r reference sake, the book can, can be downloaded from the internet if you don't happen to have a copy handy. Um, the book, uh, according to the internet, has been debunked chapter by chapter in a lengthy online interview by Auckland University of Technology PhD candidate Paul McBride. Um, and that uh, comes from Rational Wiki, so it's a fairly prominent uh, a debunking, or attempted debunking anyway. I want you to notice something. Uh, Paul McBride is a PhD candidate. He's not a PhD. Now, that is not to say that we shouldn't listen to what he has to say. But what it is to say is that if you ever hear somebody saying, well, he doesn't have a PhD, or his PhD is from a little Bible college somewhere, or something like that, notice that they don't hold their own people to the same standard. The objections to chapter one, um, there is the direct objection, and then another one that we'll come to because it's going to be important in the logic, um, and there are the uh, websites, and then also the objection to chapter two, and those are the ones we'll be covering today. There are objections to chapter three, chapter four, and chapter five, so um, those of you who want to read ahead for next week uh, can do so. Um, these, I think, are all in the email that I sent as well. So if you prefer, you can open the email up, click it, and, and find those uh, links. Um, I'm indebted to Jeff Sonnentag for this. Uh, he put up uh, the video of uh, Chapter 1's uh, plain comments at uh, clubadventist.com, which is apparently a forum there that they have. And, um, and he got a comment immediately afterwards. Um, I think it's only one so far, um, by somebody who goes by the name of Igakuse. I don't know if that's Japanese or made up or what, but somewhere. Um, and here's his comments, here by some actual evolutionary biologists. Of course, that's a little snark, because I'm not an actual evolutionary biologist. Um, also go through the book chapter by chapter. And the first one I'm going to ignore for now. We may come back to him later. He's mostly secondary stuff. The second one is the uh, uh, first reference that I put up. And um, you can ask, was this cherry-picked? Uh, well, if so, it was by Igakusi, not by me. And uh, there are comments in the book at Rational Wiki, and I'll just give you the entire part of uh, and of course, that's the Rational Wiki uh, website, uh, reception to the book uh, Science and Human Origins. It is an anti-science book and has been received and has received negative reviews from scientists. I'm just publishing it exactly the way it was on the, and they misspelled received. Sorry about that. Don't hold it against them. We all do that. Um, negative reviews from scientists for pu pushing a religious agenda. The sole purpose of the book 
was an attempt to try and prove Adam and Eve existed. How's that for a statement of the book? Um, actually, I thought the first two chapters were about something entirely different, which is far more important even than Adam and Eve existing. Um, the book has been debunked chapter by chapter in lengthy online interview, and we've read this part earlier. And so this is, like I said, this is what everybody recommends from the other side you ought to read if you want to evaluate the book. Uh, and uh, note the candidate. If you're not supposed to listen to people who are got their PhD in the field, why obviously you shouldn't listen to him. I don't think that's true. I think we need to listen to everybody. But that's just me. Okay, and again, I'm doing a little bit of a Reader's Digest edition. I haven't put every single thing he puts up, but you can read the rest of it and see if I left out anything that's really important. And if it is, if I did, I go ahead and hammer me, uh, and I'll apologize. Um, <coughs> Gauger questions the certainty that evolutionary biologists have in the notion of common descent, with a broad claim that it is merely similarity rather than relatedness that we observe. Well, we of course can't observe relatedness directly, because we have not seen the critters from which these two varieties of bacteria or humans came from, with the exception of Linsky's experiments. Nobody's really done true evolutionary experiments. Um, so it is similarity that we observe. And uh, of course, he wants to extrapolate that into relatedness. She tells us that certainly humans and chimpanzees share a number of common features, but so do, and this is her example, Ford Tauruses and Mustangs. Yet the latter are designed, indicating that similarity cannot rule out design. As this is Gauger's analogy, let's look at it closer. Now, the so one thing I will point out is the analogy does show that at least some things that are similar, and everybody agrees that they're similar, do not have a common ancestor. And therefore, you need to prove common ancestry through more than similarity. Now, his, this is his attempt to get around that. Uh, in the Ford example, a fair assessment of similarity is the Ford example, a fair assessment of the similarity in biology. In fact, the design, designed objects do not usually form a nested hierarchy in the way that species do under common descent. This is because there are fewer constraints on designed objects than there are on biological ones. When new technology arises, a safer braking system in a car perhaps, or a faster processor in a mobile phone, it will make it into the top of the line models no matter who makes them. That should be no matter, I'm sure, but that's the way it comes off of the, the blog. Um, but not into the cheaper ones. When this happens, all of the more expensive models, have all of the more expensive models become more closely related. And the idea is that you have, uh, say, an ABS, and um, you find it in Cadillacs and not in Chevrolets, and you find it in Lincolns and not in Fords. And therefore, the Chevrolet are more closely related to the Ford in this case, and the Lincoln is more closely related to the Cadillac. When, of course, two of them are by General Motors, and two of them are by uh, a Ford, Mo Ford Motor Company. Now, actually that's not true. And one of the things that probably should be pointed out is that, in fact, what Ford Motor Company will do is patent its anti-locking uh, brake system so that when Cadillac wants to have one of its own, they have to do it a slightly different way. So you won't have directly comparable uh, 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 expensive models. There actually, you can trace that there's a difference. And when the new uh, braking system gets into the newer Fords, they will have the Ford braking system and not the Cadillac, which now has its own patent on its own stuff. Um, at this point, I'd say it's a rather 
dumb argument. He's arguing. Oh, he's arguing over uh, uh, examples, not biological facts. Oh, well, that is true. That is true. But even if you ignore this particular point, I think there's something else that's even more fundamental. This lack of in independence between lineages means that they do not have single reliable groupings and do not form a nested hierarchy. Remember that. The key to proving evolution is a nested hierarchy. Now, the converse of that is, of course, that if you don't have a nested hierarchy, you show evidence against common ancestry. Right? I mean, that's the logical. Now, at this point, he gets cold feet because he'll say, in biology, for unrelated lines to share common derived features, those features must evolve independently. OK, so now we have an explanation for why the same thing might be in one clade and not in, an uh, and not in another closely related. But over here, it's in a third clade and not in a fourth clade <coughs> that maybe they've evolved independently. So you see what he's trying to do. He's, he's trying to say they're all a nested hierarchy except when they aren't. Now, the reason that's important is because, what about bats and whales? And the protein that's in the little hair cells that detect motion that needs to be there if you're going to have ultrasonic hearing. Nested hierarchy, anyone? Bats and whales are related to each other more closely than either of them are to, say, cows. No? In fact, bats and porpoises are more closely related than bats and uh, than porpoises and baleen whales. They have the same protein. In fact, if you look at the book in chapter five, you see another clear example of where nested hierarchy doesn't work. Now first I'll show you where nested hierarchy does work. Introns one and four of the uh, HLA B, it's the HLA DR, uh, B1. And, and you can see that the, that the rhesus monkeys, or pardon me, the macaque monkeys, nicely nest into their own little group and the chimpanzees nicely nest into their own little group. And the humans, there are five of these here, but they all nicely nest into a human group that is more closely, even this one is more closely related to humans than it is to chimpanzees or macaques. That's what a nested hierarchy looks like. Now take a look at Exxon 2, where you have macaques, chimpanzees, and humans all in the same group then another group that has chimpanzees and humans. Then another group that has macaques and humans and closely related to it, but not, uh, not quite as closely, is another one that has chimpanzees and humans. What do you do with those non-nested hierarchies? Doesn't that kind of destroy the argument that, that uh, biology is Fundamentally, all nested hierarchies. Well, this is the argument that we're making: is that sometimes you do get nice nested hierarchies if you're looking at certain things, and sometimes you don't. And if you're putting all your weight on, well, they're nested hierarchies, and therefore they're different from automobiles. What do you do with data like the Exxon 2 data? So continuing with McBride's commentary, we are left with a choice. Common descent provides a sound and simple explanation for the nested hierarchical relationship in biology, of course, but not the non-nested ones. While design would only result in the same if the designers arbitrarily chosen limits. So every time you hear about the same protein being used in different, completely different organisms, that's an argument for design.
If, for example, you have opsin, uh, bacterial rhodopsin in bacteria and in rice, then uh, that's an argument for God using the same switch in bacteria as in rice because most people will agree that rice um, um, is more closely related to wheat and corn and things like that than it is to bacteria. And they don't have it. Well, design would only result in the same if the designer has arbitrarily chosen limits. Obviously, this is not impossible, but it's difficult to understand if the designer is sentient because the limits we observe in biology often result in suboptimal functioning and other sweeping constraints. Well, at least suboptimal by his definition. Um, remember, optimal is not perfect. It's getting the best options from a number of different ones that have different constraints on them, saying you want to maximize all the different functions that you can, but some functions will simply not be maximized. And notice that this is now a theological argument. This is important because what McBride is trying to do is he's trying to destroy common design by saying the designer wouldn't do it that way. Notice that that's not an argument that unguided evolution can do it that way. It's rather uh, trying to shoot down your opponents rather than having your, demonstrating the ability of your own theory. That becomes important later. We then move on to the fossil record. Gauger argues that it is problematic that the fossil record has gaps in it. While frustrating its limitations from the human perspective of discovery, this fact about the fossil record is neither supportive of intelligent design nor unexpected under evolutionary theory. Whoa! Not unexpected? We don't expect gaps in the fossil record? Are we, ex we expect gaps in the fossil record from an evolutionary point of view? Then I, I, I ask, what does evolutionary theory predict at all? If it isn't gradualism, There's a book out right now called Darwin's Doubt, I think it is, by, um, by Steve Meyer. And it's about, among other things, but mostly, the Cambrian explosion. And it's pointing out that Darwin's theory didn't expect the Cambrian explosion because there are all these animals and there's no trace of how they got there. And that was unexpected in Darwin's time. It's still unexpected today. People still argue against that it actually happened. They try to say it took a lot longer than we think. And, and there are some organisms out there that might have. Those are all arguments because everybody knows that Darwinism requires gradual improvement until you get where you are. And it is totally unexpected to have everything pop in with no ancestors. He's, he's completely ignoring the history on this. Um, Gauger gives us several highlights of the major differences between humans and chimpanzees. Many mutations are, of course, responsible for these differences. Gauger then sets out to make the task of this being a transition from a common ancestor look impossible. Notice that she doesn't observe that it looks impossible. She um, sets out to, to do this task. You see, Gauger is just really arguing by this point of view. She's not really trying to reflect reality because all those guys really argue because if they really knew the truth, they would agree with us. Or is it all arguing? But do notice the concession. Many mutations are, of course, responsible for these differences. So there are a lot of mutations that, requ that are required to turn a proto-human, proto-chimp into a human, 
and a lot more that are required to turn that thing into a chimp. A lot of mutations. That's conceded. Gauger shows that evolution could not be responsible for the differences. Now she's, now she's showing it, by the way. Um, bacteria, she reasons, could not have had more than a series of six preordained mu neutral mutations that substitute in their populations before the limits of probability are reached. Of course, Gauger never goes so far as to state that the mutations causing human differences were preordained, but that is exactly what she's implying. Preordained. You see, because we had a goal in mind and evolution doesn't have a goal, so therefore preordained is a bad word in evolution. But that leads to the question, who preordained them? Which would immediately highlight the circularity of the argument. If they're a result of evolution, they were not preordained. But notice, the, notice that his argument is now circular in the opposite direction. If they're the result of evolution, they were not preordained. And therefore, it is inappropriately, inappropriate to consider their multiplicative properties, probabilities as the probability of human evolution. We don't do probabilities because it's not appropriate. Besides that, it would look bad for our side. Preordained. The reason that needs to be in there is because he has to argue that she's not being fair to the theory. Well, in one sense, she's not. She's asking the theory to do an impossible task. On the other hand, it's a task that has been done. Maybe the theory fails. And this is not where McBride wants to go. Gauger doesn't think that random mutations can result in meaningful biological change, which she demonstrates by, surprise, a computer programming analogy, the workhorse analogy of the ID advocate. In her version, she asks us to Imagine letting your toddler loose on your computer operating system, allowing her to randomly change ones to zeros, or insert or delete stretches of ones and zeros, or rearrange them in the code. How likely is it that she will develop a new subroutine that improves the function of the operating system? Now, stop here and notice what he's going to do with this. The question that she asked was not how likely is she to destroy the program. The question that she asks is, how likely is it that she will develop a new subroutine that improves the function of the operating system? Two different questions. She's asking, how do you produce new information? Watch his answer. No one will disagree with Anne that this is unlikely in the extreme. So he's agreeing with her on that point. But fortunately for us all, DNA isn't a computer program. Computer programs require very specific changes in order to be meaningful at all. Well, most random changes will cause a catastrophic failure. By comparison, many changes to DNA have relatively gentle effects. Tinkering is possible. To be sure, many DNA mutations are detrimental, but many also have little effect. Uh, how many of them improve DNA? That's the question she's asking, and that's the question he's avoiding. And you know what? Even his illustration breaks down because in, even in computers, there are some changes that don't really matter much. Let's suppose you have a program that, whose job it is to take a PDF and project it to a screen. That's a Fairly complex task. If you've ever programmed, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, in the core of the program, it is true. You start messing up those ones and zeros, everything will fall apart. More than likely. On the other hand, if you mess up stuff in the picture, you know what? All you'll see is a little glitch here or there, perhaps a little faded area or a little more intense area or an area that was reddish turning more bluish. Um, so that, in fact, computers are forgiving of changes in ones and zeros in the data. In fact, if they weren't, you couldn't project three different pro uh, 
uh, PDFs or, or uh, JPEGs or whatever onto a screen. But what she's asking is, what we want to do is do something new, like have the projection there and maybe have a little something up in the left-hand corner or perhaps in the right-hand corner, perhaps the right lower corner, where um, what you have is a little thumbnail sketch of the whole thing or an enlargement of some detail. Something like that that has a new function. And the question is, can you do that by just kind of uh, typing in numbers into the computer? Those of you who've done computing, I don't think so. Now, is it any different for, um, for DNA? Doesn't really answer that. And I suspect the reason why is because if we start going that way, it will be pretty evident pretty soon that you need some very specific stuff in order to get a new function. Gagar finally moves on to the claim that humans are indeed exceptional. While we happen to be hierarchically nested within a clade of apparently unexceptional animals, we are special. We are not souped up apes. We paint paintings and sing songs. We communicate in sophisticated language. This is all McBride's comment um, about what Anne Gagar has to say. Uh, remarkably, we can reflect on our origins. Actually taken together, this seems like a lot this seems a lot like we are souped up apes. They may lack our refinement, but certainly have complex social interactions and communication. None of them ever attend lectures like this, I can promise you. Um, we happen to have larger brains that allow us to contemplate things. This all gets rather subjective, and Gauger tacitly acknowledges this. I personally am convinced that unguided, unintelligent processes can't do the job, not only because the neo-Darwinian mechanism is utterly insufficient, but also because we are beings capable of intelligence and creativity. Because we have intelligence, an unintelligent process cannot explain our origin. Uh, I don't think that's how Anne would phrase it. I think that's a bit on the shallow. I would say an intelligent process has difficulty explaining it, and an unintelligent process that has certain kinds of limitations cannot explain it. See, she's a, see he's avoiding the question of uh, how many mutations does it take to get from a chimpanzee to a human, and what kinds are they? Fortunately, at this point, the chapter ends before Gauger gets any further from the scientific explanation of our origin that the chapter had promised. What? I don't recall any promise of a scientific explanation of our origins. In fact, if you go back to the book's claim from the introduction, in chapters 1 and 2, Anne Gauger and Douglas Axe challenge the central claim that Darwin's undirected mechanism of natural selection is really capable of building a human being. It doesn't say anything about we're going to present the real reason or the real way that it happened, does it? Although much of this book focuses on the shortcomings of Darwinian theory, much of this book focuses on the shortcomings of Darwinian theory. That's what the focus is on, not building a new theory of their own. The scientists represented here are not merely critics of the existing paradigm and so forth. Um, from chapter one, when I first saw these stories, it struck me how uncritically all these people accepted the scientific arguments for human evolution. This is a mistake. That's the thrust. Evolution can't do this. Yet I know from my own experiments that similarity between two complex structures does not reliably indicate an evolutionary path between them. That is actually the, probably the s simplest statement of what she intends to do in the, in the chapter. Has nothing to do with building your own. Again from chapter one, in fact, there's a surprising disregard among evolutionary biologists for the amount of genetic change that would be needed to actually accomplish the evolutionary transitions they propose and the amount of time it would require. As I shall explain, these obstacles are a significant factor in human evolution and indicate that we cannot have come from an ape-like ancestor by an unguided process. That's what the chapter is driving at. That's what the next chapter will drive at. And the point is, that if you don't deal with that, you haven't dealt with 
what's really there. Note that McBride makes no comments on the key points. That it takes seven mutations to change the function of a particular enzyme to another particular enzyme. And that six neutral mutations are all that are allowed in a reasonable Dar Darwinian scenario. And two are too many if we're talking about large mammals. If you want to summarize the data that they produce and the point that they're trying to make, that's it. Now, McBride does address one of those questions in a different area, although I don't recall him linking to that. I, I may be wrong on that. But um, he does say in another blog that he wrote, they have a point that should be addressed directly. How probable, they ask, is, for, is it for one enzyme to evolve from another with a different function? First, no evolutionary model predicts that the transition from GA, that GA, that's Gauger and Axe 2011, that's the paper that they wrote that they cite in, in their book, um, attempt to model historically occurred. That is, from one modern protein, KB12, to another BioF2. Interestingly, this is something that the authors themselves state, despite the conclusions they draw. The enzymes in question derived from a common ancestral sequence through gene duplication. One was not derived from the other as their study models. So he's saying they're, they're really not doing it fairly to evolution. Nevertheless, accepting the limitations of the work, the study still shows that a specified transfer, transition of seven or more nucleotide substitutions are needed to get from enzyme X to Y in this case. So what they set out to do, they did. And they were accurate. He says, it just doesn't have relevance to evolution. The second problem is that their approach is rather limited in its scope. The authors find a possible chain of substitutions that could result in a transition from one enzyme function to the other and then mandate that under a likely scenario, each must have occurred and drifted to fix fixation. What remains unexplored here, so this is the flaw he's picking in that paper, and perhaps it is impossible to fully explore. So maybe it's a necessary flaw in the paper, but you gotta start somewhere, is how many other pathways might exist, firstly between the two enzymes, but also between other existing enzymes in the target. <coughs> If the target is function Y, it may not be important whether enzyme X is the starting point or something entirely different, or whether enzyme Y is the only enzyme that could achieve function Y. I doubt many people would argue that the transition to specific enzyme Y is anything but unlikely. So he's conceding their point. This is almost certainly true, but it is hardly the only scenario by which function Y might arise. Now, let me try to illustrate kind of what he's trying to say. You have enzyme X, you want to get to enzyme Y. Well, he's conceding that the paper shows that you can't get from X to Y in reasonable evolutionary time. So this is an unbridgeable gap if these are the only enzymes there are. Now, of course, there are other enzymes with different functions, some of which are closely related to these enzymes and some of which are wildly unrelated. But what he's saying is basically that test is not a fair test because who knows, maybe there was an ancestral <coughs> enzyme that could give rise to both Y and X. Okay? Or perhaps that's not the way it was. There's actually a whole chain of enzymes that could go from Y to X. And maybe you started with X and went to this and went to this and went to this and went to Y. Or maybe you started with uh, this enzyme and went both ways. Or maybe you started with this enzyme. So that's another possibility. Uh, yes, Ariel. Well, but would these be just six steps? He's got longer steps here. He's lost his case. Well, no, no I'm saying, let's supposing that, you know, this one is, is three steps, and this one is two steps, and this one is, uh, maybe four steps, and, and this one is only one until you actually get into Y and are able to maneuver, and, and, maneuver and, and, and that's close enough for evolution to have gone through all of those in a bacterial population. 
So maybe they're right. Or maybe really what happened was that it came from a different enzyme and it started over here and then went to Y. Or maybe Y is one of several different enzymes that could all do the same thing. There's Y, there's Y prime, and there's another Y out here and another Y out here, all of which can do this little twisting of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of precursors to biotin. So it didn't start from X at all. It actually didn't even get, uh, it just randomly happened to get to Y. Um, and uh, we're actually lucky that it wasn't Y prime, in which case, uh, but see, the problem with doing that is you're multiplying areas where the function Y could come out of a particular sequence is actually a little bit of a problem. And that is that let's say that your probability is 10 to the minus 27th. And let's say that you have 10 of these different targets that you could do. Well, what you've done now is you've reduced your probability to 10 to the minus 26th, which is not really getting there. If there are a thousand different basic enzyme types. We're not talking about, because these, these circles are of a specified diameter, or perhaps uh, different circles for different sizes. Um, those circles are already big, and all you have to do is just get to the edge, and then the hill will pull you up the rest of the way. Um, if you have a thousand of these, and your probability is 10 to the minus 27th, then when you get done, your probability is 10 to the minus 24th, which is still way too big. And to you know, hypothesize that there are millions and millions, well, you have to have 10 to the 27th in order to make it probable enough that one of them will finally make it there. Or perhaps 10 to the 26th plus a little luck. That's the problem with arguing this way. And the fact of the matter is, what we have is not Y prime for, for making the precursor of biotin. What we have is Y. And you have to explain how we got to Y. And so even if this is highly probable, and this is not, why did it choose this one instead of that one in that case? Or why did this occur instead of that one? And that's basically the argument is trying to increase the probabilistic resources or the probabilistic target. But it doesn't really do the job. Finally, this is again McBride criticizing uh, Gauger in particular. Their approach relies implicitly on teleology. Now, you're going, what? They're talking about mechanistic results. This is, most un, this is the most unrealistic part of the analysis and a principal reason why the results are not pr uh, problematic for neo-Darwinian evolution. You can ignore this. Nothing to see here. Move on. In order to require that a series of seven sequential nucleotide substitution need to occur to get from function X to function Y, function Y needs to be a preordained target. More specifically here, GA 2011, uh, that's a paper, says enzyme X has to evolve into enzyme Y to achieve a particular functional shift. But evolution does not and could not proceed in this fashion. Evolution could not proceed in this fashion. I think that's an admission that evolution cannot produce what we see in nature. The appearance of design that we see is, in fact, real. Now, because they go on to, he, he goes on to say, while some particular traits confer advantages, never can we say that a particular trait had to evolve. Oh, really? 
What about DNA transcription en enzymes? Don't they kind of have to evolve? What about ribosomes? Don't they kind of have to evolve if you're going to have life at all? What about the basics of metabolism? Don't you have to have that in order to, in order to get a cell to function, period? If you need biotin, you're going to have to have some enzyme that makes it. It's that simple. This idea that you don't have to have a particular function. Well, you do. And if nothing had to evolve, then why, do, you know, why didn't we just all stay bacteria? Perhaps the neo-Darwinian ex evolution is an in inadequate explanation. This idea that you can have multiple targets at some point, there are not enough targets to overcome the odds of reaching one. Now, to move on to chapter two, he's much shorter on chapter two. Axe reminds us that, be, that the question of human origins is important because, once again, it connects to how we should think of ourselves. I've never understood this line of thinking. The implication is that if we think of ourselves as descended from apes, we will treat each other, treat other people as apes, which is to say, apparently badly. Um, didn't abortion get started precisely because people said, oh, it's just a little bunch of tissue, it's not really human, you don't have to treat it with respect? Isn't infanticide the same thing? And before we say, oh, but that was Gosnell, we don't believe in that. <laughs> Remember, uh, some people from uh, National Abortion Rights League were arguing that if the baby comes out in a botched abortion, then what happens to it should be between the mother and the physician. And you have no right to make a law that says, oh, those babies need to be protected now at that point. They're outside the mother. The mother's got her own body back. What about euthanasia? But the truth of the matter is, all Axe is doing here is he's saying there's a reason for looking at this hard, not saying I'm right because of this reason. And I think that he's making a fair point. Notice that the blog's name is Still Monkeys. Now, I think this is meant ironically, so I'm not going to knock that too much. The ill-considered wor uh, words of a Darwin impersonator. See, here's, here we are. The implication is that if we think of ourselves as descended from apes, we will treat people, other people's apes, which is to say, apparently badly. At the heart of this chapter, now, see, he acknowledges that that's really a red herring. He's just throwing stuff out and he's trying to say, uh, Axe doesn't know what he's talking about. At the heart of this chapter, after the scene is set for why we should care, is the argument that positive natural selection, that is Darwinian selection, is incapable of producing biological novelties. Here Axe re reiterates the works uh, that Gauger already discussed in the first chapter. Interestingly, Axe is interested in whether selection can cause one protein with a given function to evolve into another protein with a different target function. While Axe claims that he and Gauger bent over backwards to make the task relatively easy, they did not bend over backwards to make the task realistic. Evolution does not focus on single genes in isolation. But wait a minute, what about reality as opposed to evolutionary theory? Reality is that the, that the enzyme is there. <coughs> Indeed, puny natural selection was not up to the task. It would take trillions of years for the change Axe and Gauger had asked of selection. They're right. He's conceding. If Gauger and Axe couldn't get a single protein to evolve a novel function of their choosing, uh, they chose an easy one. They chose the easiest one they could find in that particular group of enzymes and the two closest together that they could find. Actually, no. Gauger's and Axe's experiment is a profound misunderstanding of evolution. 
The real question is not can x be turned into y because that sense of direction requires preordination. No, the question is can x turn into y because we see y and we want to know why y is there. If we remove this preordination, the question becomes, can X turn into something else? We have great contemporary examples of real biological evolution of substantial novelty that Axe omits from his chapter, yet such examples might be given a hint of some of, might give a hint, might have given a hint of some of the possibilities within evolution. Bacteria that degrade nylon, that should be nylon, they misspelled it, but whatever for their energy have evolved in the natural environment in the short time since humans invented nylon. Now the question is, how many mutations did it take? Turns out, I think about three. Well, that's well within the limits, right? The limit is six. And also, it didn't happen the very first year. Also, Richard Lenski's lab has evolved a strain of E. coli that it metabolizes citrate as its sole energy source. Well, there's more to that story than that, but how many mutations did that take? If I understand right, it was about three again. So that's within range. It's when you try to get seven that you're in trouble. I might mention at this point his chapter has references to only a Richard Dawkins book, a 1960s book challenging neo-Darwinism, two papers first authored by Gauger, and only two peer-reviewed journal articles from the mainstream literature. As such, Axe is writing with almost no engagement with the real arguments from the contemporary evolutionary biology literature. I would maintain that's because the real arguments from the contemporary evolutionary biology literature don't deal with this problem with the exception of two articles, and those articles skewer them. And things only get worse. Axe sums up his brief contribution with a section called A View from the Sapien Summit. After accusing scientists of accepting evolution too easily, he asks of scientists, have they done the experiments to measure the fitness effect of each single mutation along the line of chimps that eventually produced the ones that did the talk? Did they verify that each increase the fitness enough to become established in a natural population. Now, he totally misses the background of that. The background of that is that in humans you only get one mutation and then it has to be multiplied at that point by natural selection. So you have to have a mutation that's, that's advantageous, another mutation that has advantageous, and so on all the way up the line. Two mutations is too many because we don't have enough humans. Yes, Axe's view of neo-Darwinian evolution is that it only involves mutations with large increases in fitness. That's because he's read the literature. Otherwise, they don't establish in natural populations. His picture of the scientific view of human evolution is an orderly stepwise march in fitness upward from lowly apes to grand man. The other interesting point here is that Axe is suggesting that until the day that each single mutation leading from a common ancestor with, to chim with chimpanzees to man is predicted in order, ah, I didn't, he didn't say in order. It could be in whatever order happens to be most easy to produce. Any order will work. With each mutation individually investigated for its fitness effects, there's still room to argue about holes in evolutionary theory. No, there is still the really unlikelihood of evolutionary theory. And leave room for the calm guiding hand of the intelligent designer. For a while at least, we are spared having to believe like, uh, like, behave like dirty apes. You see what he's doing? If, if we boil down the Axis chapter to its essentials, and we did that and when we discussed chapter two, they are. One, the limits of change for bacteria are six neutral mutations. It takes seven to make a specific simple step from one enzyme to another in bacteria. It's not likely to have happened in the lifetime of the universe. For humans, two neutral mutations are too many to be reasonable. And by the way, that was taken straight from the literature. And then the coup de gras, in my opinion, we need 20 whole gene 
families to get humans from chimpanzees. 20 whole new gene families. Not just mutations, not even just genes, but a whole family of genes. And we need 20 of them. And you're going to tell me that this happened where every single mutation was advantageous because the literature says two neutral mutations are too many to be reasonable. That's the literature. McBride's response is that what we have is a profound misunderstanding of evolution. No, we don't. We have a profound understanding of reality and realize that evolution won't fit. That's what's really going on. I think that McBride talked past the two main points of the first two chapters. I think his rescue position that evolution would have been happy with any target and it just happened that the target it hit was humans or even a biotin precursor producing enzyme is really reaching. It's highly improbable in the first place. There's no current evidence for it. We don't know of any enzyme that could have gone both ways. If real arguments from the contemporary evolutionary biology literature don't deal with the problem, outlined by Gauger and Axe, then the contemporary literature is simply not dealing with serious, possibly fatal problems for neo-Darwinism. You may remember that Behe said he surveyed the literature and they didn't have any de detailed evolutionary pathways. Well, that's not how evolution works. Does evolution work is the real question. But now it's time for you to comment. Yes, Nick. Oh, uh, do we, we get a. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that man says that we are behaving like apes. My question is is it possible that we are behaving worse than? apes. And uh, uh, let me mention something important I read yesterday. There is a man named an attorney, Adventist attorney named Michael Peabody. Do you know him? I've heard of him. I don't know him personally. Okay. He is investigating and he asked me for some information because he is investigating what happened in Maryland when the Adventist was trying to get the permit to build a new hospital and the Catholics were trying to get the same permit. And the Adventist said, and oh, the Adventist, we can do abortions and they can't. And the Adventist argument was we offer a superior health uh, program to our people because we offer abortion. And I'm citing literally what the representative from the Adventist Church said. We offer abortion. Yes. In other words, we don't only heal people, we also kill people. That's superior to what Catholics do. Well, it, so, it, it, also, um, it also is very politically correct right now. I'm sorry? It's, it, is, it is also very politically correct right now. It would appeal to the uh, uh, to the uh, governor of Maryland, among other people. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave out all of the, because, because what we want to do is we want to keep this into the, into the area of, of uh, what we do with uh, the criticism of Axe's book. But I am going to say that I think that we as a, we as a church have, uh, are, Maybe I should put it this way. Some very uh, influential Adventists, I think, have lost their way on this particular subject. And, uh, and I'm going to agree with you that, uh, that I think that that's not, that should not have been a selling point. In fact, 
um, uh, whether it's politically correct or not, and it may, may have been wise for Adventists not to say anything about it, but, uh, uh, but I certainly think that that's, for Adventists, that's leading with your chin. Now, can I ask you, if you have time, not right now, but before this session is over, could you say something about whether we are behaving worse like monkeys? Do monkeys well, we are obviously behaving worse than monkeys because monkeys don't know enough to behave that badly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Sure. Thank you. That would suggest what someone else has said, smart enough to be a problem, but not smart enough to be a solution. Uh, Ariel, I think you've been waiting for this. Yeah, it seems to me that what's interesting here, I don't need two mics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, McBride has uh, you know, bypassed the real issue of the chapter and that is is there a designer or isn't there a designer he just circles all around it doesn't get at the real issue uh, well that's an e that's not even the the question is being asked is can neo darwinism explain what we see and if you read between <laughs> the lines of mcbride the obvious answer is no it can't explain what we see so what we'll say is that well there were trillions and trillions and trillions of trillions of different scenarios that could have happened and we just happen to be in one of them. Of course, uh, this is the multiverse uh, argument it, to an extent. Where it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a one universe variant of the multiverse argument. Yes, and you can ask the question, where is your data? Do you have no data to support this? Uh, it's okay, it's imagination, but it's not hard science. Well, you don't uh, need that. I mean, after all, we are here, there wasn't a God, so it must have happened somehow. And uh, no matter what the odds are, it just happened. And I, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to slip in a, a comment here about the Cambrian explosion and how this fits so much better with the idea of this is what, what represents the lowest pre-flood seas. That's why you don't have the ancestors before. And uh, fits with the idea of the Genesis flood and so on. Uh, that package makes so much more sense than the evolutionary package. Oh, I agree. Yes. Isn't there a fundamental misunderstanding of the theory of probability involved here too? Uh, in the argument that because something is highly improbable, it's going to take a long time for it to occur. We hear all these stories of someone who never bought a lottery ticket before and they buy the lottery ticket, and although the odds are 27 million to one, they're winning, they win on their first buy. Uh, similarly, in a four-handed game of poker, draw poker, although there is very little chance of a royal flush, say one out of 50,000, it's conceivable that people would sit down at the table and draw royal flush the first time. Well, it is. But let's supposing that you have three drawings. Okay, and somebody wins them all. Uh, somebody's going to win because the, the odds are, if there are enough tickets, that somebody probably will win. And if half the people are newbies, then there probably is 50 50 that you're going to have a newbie win. Mm -hmm. And you don't know which newbie at the beginning. Okay, but let's supposing that you do the lottery and uh, some newbie wins. Then you have next week the same lottery done again and the same newbie wins. Well, who's not a newbie anymore. But again, I've heard... And then the, second, the third time it happens and the same person wins. Don't you at some point start saying, um, does he have a relative that works in the... In the, <laughs> the point is that no matter how improbable something is, if it's possible for it to occur, then it can occur, and it can occur at any time. 
Well, you know, it, it is in between. It is it is improbable <coughs> that um, all of the air will have the oxygen leave the area around me, and I will asphyxiate because I only get to breathe nitrogen for say ten minutes. Okay, and it's also improbable that. Uh, a hole will spontaneously open in the front of my chest. It could happen. It could happen. But if you see a hole opening in front of my chest and you see me falling down, you don't start attributing it to these highly improbable things. You start asking the question, was there somebody up there with a pellet gun or something of that nature that might have caused it instead. Exactly. And, and so what's really happening here is, you see, if you start out with the religious dogma that there cannot be any interference in nature from a, um, a, a force that's not controlled by nature, if you start out with that dogmatism, then you know the odds really don't matter because we're here. But if you start saying, well, was there a designer or wasn't there? And you look at it, and as Richard Dawkins himself said, everything in biology, uh, the biology is a study of complex objects that look like they were designed for a purpose. And then you say, and how improbable is evolution without some kind of guidance? And the answer is, it's 10 to the 500 millionth. That's probably an underestimate, by the way. And you're weighing these two theories. Don't you go with the one that, that looks like? You know, if Arnold Schwarzenegger wins the lottery once, well, not Arnold now, uh, let's say Jerry Brown wins the lottery once. I want an investigation. If he wins it twice, I don't need an investigation. <laughs> Yet again, uh, there are what gamblers call winning streaks. And there are many instances where highly improbable events occur several times over. Uh, but there are limits to that. <laughs> I just want to say one thing, that all, all the givens, all the controls of the system are under one scrutiny, and that's God. And with his measurement, all the probabilities, all the sequences are all random and all controlled within his control, not our control. So if it's under his control, who is the one to judge what is the winning streak? Who is the one to judge what is the losing streak? Who is the one to judge? There is no one to be the judge. God is the one who judges, and he is the one who's correct. You see, if you, have, if you have somebody down behind you controlling what's going on, okay. then, then, yeah, you can have highly improbable things happen. Um, but at a certain point, probability starts to, starts to be lost as a good explanation. It just does. Especially if you have an alternative. And that's why they don't want you to consider the alternative. They don't want you to think intelligent design can't possibly be right. Because once you say, well, it looks designed. It looks like it's highly probable if it was designed, and you say mm -hmm. it's highly improbable if it wasn't. Then the logical thing to do is to go with the probabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they don't want you to do that. We need to always be aware that there are improbabilities, and improbabilities occur, and so on. But uh, to base our whole rationality on that will not help us arrive at truth. If there are two events and one is more probable than the other, I'm going to go with the one that's more probable uh, simply because uh, reasoning says that that's more likely. In our search for truth, uh, let's be aware there are exceptions and there are extreme improbable events. They are extremely rare. Uh, but if you're going to find truth, you need to go with that which is more reasonable. I think that's true.
I, I was going to say that another another way, same thing, but you know, if, kind of a simple way. If it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. I mean, it's just kind of, you know, let's go with the obvious thing first, and then examine that. If if there's any better theories, but I think we should take the best theory that uh, observation and science, true science, open-minded mm -hmm. science can, uh, can... But that means you accomplish. can't have... Well, what is it? Because we know it's not a duck. And it's strange that in those that accuse others of not doing science, they try and ignore probabilities and they try and ignore the possibility. When you, when you analyze your data, you're always asking what's what the data is telling you and what's the most probable cause for the result that you got. You never go and say, okay, uh, my odds are that I have a 50% chance it's this and I have a, a 10 to the minus 50th chance that it's that. I'm scientifically going to pick the 10 to the minus 50th because that's the most scientific thing to do here. I mean, we routinely, when you do things, you look at your data and you look at the analysis of that and it would be considered very unscientifically to continually pick the highly improbable as your methodology. And so it's kind of ironic that you get accused of lack of science when you pick the higher probability. Um, yes, uh, um, Danilo. I have sometimes had some misgivings about using probability altogether, as, as Brother here has pointed out. And the reasons are, are, are a little bit different, not because of the stratospheric numbers that one requires in order to justify something happening, but for the, um, for the logical reasons when probability analysis is in fact employed. We use probability when we have incomplete information when we have sparse data, when we have only a sampling of what's out there, and we're trying to calculate what are the odds that the samples that we've got in hand actually represent fairly what's out there, so that we can draw some reasonable conclusions on the basis of that. But that's not all of math. In fact, when we start doing analysis of trends, of changes, that analysis, there is a whole discipline called calculus. And you're st studying uh, the behavior of various mathematical formula as, as the trends move as n goes to some limit somewhere, or to infinity, or whatever. Now, what the going dictum or dogma in evolutionary thinking has been, that time is the miracle worker, and that the impossible with sufficient time becomes possible, and then with more time, the possible becomes probable, and with more time, the probable becomes certain. But that is a confusion of principles. If a particular operation is properly understood, as n goes to infinity, it may go to one, or it may go to zero or it may go to whatever. It depends on the behavior of that particular function. It does by no means guarantee us, even given infinite time, that some process will achieve whatever we expect of it. That is an unrealistic appreciation of what's going on. It is a misunderstanding of what's going on. It is a wishful thinking. It does not happen that way. And usage of probabilities and that kind of jargon in this way is really an abuse of terminology just to
to get some flim-flam argument through. Does this make sense to anybody? Are we, are we on the same page here? We've got a couple of comments over here. I think science, <clears throat> scientists agree that the very, 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 very unlikely will never happen. Uh, for example, it's possible that a meteor right, could fall in the Loma Linda area in the next 24 hours. It's less likely that it would happen in the next hour. It's even less probable that it would happen right here in this room. And let's say that it would happen, that uh, it's possible that it would happen exactly at 12 o'clock. But that is so improbable that it borders on the miraculous. And I think you can see that this idea of probable and improbable has a uh, margin between naturalism and miracle. Let's put it this way. If that happened today, I would worry a lot now that you've said it. <laughs> I would See, wonder would what kind of insight you have. It would be supernatural, had. not natural. <laughs> we, have, we should have one mic over here, too. Ah, OK, you've got it. OK, uh, let me. Let me re uh, relate an anecdote. Many years ago, back in 1966, the General Conference asked us to go to Argentina. And they sent us on a boat. And they had the daily entertainments, 30 days, daily entertainments. One of those nights, they said there were six prizes to be won by anybody who wanted to participate. I can't remember the name of that uh, type of game. Uh, it's a very c uh, common, but for me, it, uh, I, I had Does no it idea. Is it a raffle or something like that? Well, similar, but I can't re recall the, the name. It was new for me. So we went, and uh, you had to put some words together, and uh, then if you if you got the right bingo bingo bingo, bingo. <laughs> okay so the first prize was won by my wife then it was my turn and then it was my son's turn and then my wife's again and then my turn and we won all the prizes uh, the Sometimes what's ignored in the probabilities is the probability of reversal of the event. And, and a lot of times the data will show that the likelihood of the, the favorable event deteriorating, we do have some data to show off and that that occurs and occurs at a much higher probability. So if you take the probabilities out to extreme, the more, sometimes the more time you add, the more likely it is you would fail because the probability of reversal is greater than the probability of sequential positive. Well, that, of course, is a, one of the problems that, that um, Gauger didn't even mention, uh, nor did Axe, is that if, if you have a mutation and you need another mutation, not only do you have the problem of keeping that mutation alive and in, a, in enough of the population to where it could turn into the other mutation uh, as well, but you also have the problem of those animals staying alive because they didn't get a third mutation that was fatal to the embryo, or they're uh, getting killed by a lion before they ever had a chance to make the second mutation. That's, that's a problem. Um, there are deleterious mutations, and there are actions outside of the mutations that mean that you're not likely to just keep going that way. Uh, and that's particularly true if you have a, two mutations, one, either one of which is mildly deleterious, but you put the two of them together and suddenly you have a new function, which is now advantageous. Um, and in fact, uh, chloroquine resistance in malaria is probably that way. And for that reason, the probabilities of chloroquine happening 
are about five orders of magnitude less likely than what they would be if you calculated them out straight. So there is that problem. That, that, and, and what happens if seven mutations and five of them are bad by themselves? They're not likely to stay around waiting for the sixth and seventh ones to finish it up and get you where you want to go. And that's, that's a problem above and beyond just simply saying they're neutral and they could be there, they could not, it doesn't matter. That's, that's a huge problem. Uh, it's hard enough to get there with genetic drift. It's harder to get there against the current. Which means that simply the elixir of adding more time does not solve the, the problem. That's exactly right. Okay, hey, so um, I, w I was wondering, have, has anyone ever calculated the probability of God existing and creating everything? <laughs> I mean, it, that's one question. Well, uh, there, have people who, there are people who have assigned that probability. But They've assigned it to zero. And that's yeah, how you get naturalism. Yeah. So it had to be something else, and God doesn't figure in on the calculations at well, all, but because it's just eliminated from the beginning. Based on the what the comments over here about time, uh, given enough time, and we know the universe is, well, you know, some may have a date of its birth, or, or you know, well, but you know what happened before that. It, it's basically an infinite amount of time. The probability would might go pretty high. Yeah. Plus it seems to fit, so and it fits better than anything else. I mean, look at it this way, the um, how many people would have would have assumed the probability of uh, a man going to the moon or the uh, the theory of relativity and the atom bomb and things like that. I don't I don't think anyone could have conceived of that that, that would have been a zero. In fact, even Air flight, they, that was a zero too, I think, at one time. Well, it is, uh, the a priori probabilities are assigned with mm -hmm. two mistakes in mild in, in, that, in that case. Number one, uh, is it even possible? There were people that said you simply couldn't fly. We know better now. Uh, they were just wrong in their assumptions, period. And that happens to us as humans all the time. And so we have to be careful about basing too much on our assumptions and being too proud of our assumptions because that's a form of pride that uh, can get us into trouble scientifically and otherwise. But the second, the second problem is uh, that we didn't get to the moon by random chance. We got to the moon by intelligent design. There's lots of things that can be done by intelligent design that just aren't going to happen by random chance. Uh, yes, Ariel, and then, uh, um, the oh, oh, you have uh, one, I'm sorry. Uh, the basis of random chance is also greater than the basis of probability because probability is the working of the reversal, as he stated, but the, the, the probability, not the, but the greater chance is greater than the, the reversal because there's always distinctions between the greater chance and um, there's no distinctions between the reversal because with greater chance we have more even greater and greater and greater um, distinctions and, exp and expanding extinctions. If you, if you guys understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Shouldn't it be added into the equation here too that any calculations based on probability theory presuppose an underlying principle of causality and there is ample evidence that there are events that go on in our universe that uh, are not uh, explicable by uh, causal principles. There is ex experimental evidence of randomness, of chance in nature, of uh, indeterminacy. And there is also, if you assume there is a multiverse, the possibility that there are other uh, universes where these principles don't apply at all. 
So we have to take that into our calculus. Well, there, there are two things that I would say to that. Um, yes. Um, uh, I think I think that there's a point you're making that's valid. Uh, I am a little concerned about the multiverse because the multiverse seems to be used when people run out of probabilities in this universe. And it uh, keep in mind that there can be no possibility of evidence for a multiverse. That's what a multiverse means. Is you're talking the universe contains everything that we know of, uh, with the possibility of the uh, the exception of of, of, well, of, course of being some. outside of the universe entirely. Uh, the the multiverse means that you have a self-contained unit and another self-contained unit, and they don't touch each other, and so you can't get from here to there. And so if you're talking about a multiverse and a truly a multiverse, it's uh, the worst violation of scientific principle you can make. There is no evidence. There can be no evidence for it. It is not a testable theory. Well, I, I would uh, take exception to that uh, when you say there can be no evidence. Uh, right now, of course, we have the announcement of the discovery of the Higgs boson. And the uh, argument uh, is that if it does confirm the standard model, this uh, one of the consequences of that would be to establish that a multiverse is possible. And you have physicists like Kaku who argue then that if there are multiple universes, they could collide. And that may be the basis of the Big Bang when two uh, universes in the bubble system collide while you generate a new universe. But there's no evidence for that. There is absolutely no evidence for that. You can't, well, yeah. there, you can't have evidence for that. That's the problem. See, now if you want to say that the universe is more complex than simply a Big Bang, that's one thing to say. If you want to say there are parts of the universe that are not observable to us at the present, well, that's obviously true anyway because none of us can observe the uh, how many, uh, let's say, how many planets there are around stars in Andromeda. But some That's are unobservable. Now, it's not unobservable in principle. If we were able to move somewhere there, we could. But the, but the definition of a universe is that it includes everything that's observable from that universe. And well, if that's the case, then, then to say that you, uh, that you have lots of multiple universes is to say that there's lots of stuff out there that we simply cannot, in principle, observe. We well, could not take a camera anywhere and, and photograph it. We could, not, uh, we could not experience it. Nothing of any kind could experience it. But uh, you are using Ansel's argument there. Essentially, you're saying you can prove ontological points from a definition. The definition of the universe excludes the possibility of a multiverse. And there are very eminent uh, cosmologists right now who are saying that if this is indeed the Higgs boson, if it is confirmed, then a mathematical consequence of the standard model is that there must be multiple universes. I'm reminded of the statement, uh, cosmologists are often wrong but never in doubt. Uh, but, uh, but I would, uh, I, I would simply state, uh, sure, we can speculate, we can, this is fine, so on. You're going to arrive at truth much more quickly if you try and stay by good data. Now, do we know that? No, but I think it's a reasonable first assumption. If you're looking for truth, I think um, you're more likely to find it uh, if you stay by the best evidence. There's good evidence, there's weak evidence, and so on and so forth. Uh, stay by that which is uh, most reliable. Yes. 
uh, using uh, the argument uh, mentioned by Boscovic and the comments made by Ken Paget, my friend over there. I would like to propose the following. Using the fact that given enough time, we can conclude that evolution is certain. Then on the same argument, creation is certain. The existence of God is certain. The multiverse is certain. The idea that, that everything that exists is just one universe is certain. If everything is certain, then nothing is certain. <laughs> okay. Um, we have some comments over here. Um, we know that uh, this universe is approximately 13.7 billion years old. Let's go back 15 billion years old. There was no universe. It's not but clear there that was you can even go 15 billion but years. But there was something where God lives. Some, whether you want to call that another universe or not, there was something out there before this earth, this uh, universe was created. So uh, <clears throat> I would say that another universe may be possible. What was God doing uh, for the eons, infinity beyond 13.7 billion years ago. Maybe he was creating then too. Maybe there's something out there that uh, he was creating and not waiting till a mere 13.7 billion years ago to create us in this universe. Or <laughs> maybe we just need much bigger telescopes in order to be able to see back further Few, many more light years in space, and we would then go from 13 billion to what, 30 billion or 100 billion? But we just need bigger telescopes to see all there is that we can see in the universe. Or maybe what we have now is a steady state universe and not a Big Bang after all. Since God, uh, um, you know, who knows? Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that if the Big Bang theory is right, then asking um, asking what was before the universe began is a little bit like asking well, what's north of the North Pole. Well, I would say, <clears throat> looking at it philosophically, <laughs> this would be a philosophical argument, that God <clears throat> um, is love. He, he is, uh, his love is infinite, and love wants objects upon which to bestow its love, such as us. He created us to, so he could love us. So to think that God has been around for an infinite number of years, that he waited till only, say, 15 or 13.7 billion years ago to create uh, people to love, objects to love, would ask the question, what was he doing during the infinite period of time before 13.7 years ago. You know, maybe well, he was the, the, the point that I'm making is this on that question. Do we know that God even exists inside of our time other than when Jesus came into it? And I think the answer is no, we don't really. And if relativity is correct, which it may or may not be, but if it is, it's entirely possible that God's outside of time as well. And that the way things run here is not the way God thinks. In which case, asking what he did before is a little pointless. It's a category confusion. Um, and if that's the case, then um, I think our attempts to pressure God for an answer to the question um, is a little bit like our kids ask, would you rather be eaten by a lion or, or, or mauled by a tiger? Um, there, there's some questions of, to which there isn't an answer. I'll grant that. So 
therefore we can't say, we can't give the answer that there was no pre-creation before this universe. We can't. We can't give there an answer that there was. We really, That's right. the fact of the matter is we're stuck in time and space the way we see each other, we see ourselves. We don't see outside of it at this point. And we have no way of knowing whether everybody else, including God, is stuck the same way or not. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I would assume that God lives in eternity, but that he chose in Christ from the foundation of the world before he created this planet and solar system, maybe even before he created the universe, that if man ever sinned, or his some created being ever sinned, he would enter time and remain in time in the person of the being, in this case human. So God is outside of time as eternal God, but he is also as a human being in forever time as well. in time. I think that's a reasonable position. Do we know for sure it's correct? No. And if we go by the Bible, then, uh, you know, I think we just have to be very careful about avoiding dogmatism because there's some things that we still don't understand. But we do know that he is in human form forever. He chose that and that he is right now doing a work for human beings in heaven, but also through his spirit inside of us. Mm -hmm. God the spirit is, is in time in us also. Diverting away from the, the original question, um, a lot of the diversion on probabilities, et cetera, in multiple universes still diverts away from the question, does Dar neo-Darwinism have a prayer of chance of explaining what we see, and, and the data does not suggest that that particular theorem can explain what we see, um, even with extreme probabilities. It just doesn't fit what we observe, observe around us. So, you know, we can get sidetracked on the other things, which are good questions, but it still doesn't excuse neo-Darwinism from failing to have a viable theory based on probabilities and, and observed science. I, I think that's true. I think that, and in fact, I think that's the whole point of this book and the point around which McBride danced very carefully, not trying to answer. Because when you come down to it, if you're only allowed one mutation without it counting and you've got to get 20 families of genes, it just ain't happening. And that's the bottom line of axes, which I think is even more powerful than Gauger's article or chapter and it's the point which McBride took every, eff every effort to distract us away. That's not the way evolution works. Well, it's the way evolution has to work if it's going to explain what we've got now. That's the problem. And that's what he didn't want to answer. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the time you're taking every week to prepare these topics that are so important and crucial for our faith. But uh, regarding the idea that God can be outside of time, I would like to propose that that is a philosophical impossibility because if God existed in eternity, he must have at least thinking, if not creating, at least he must have been thinking. And those thoughts that he was engaged in must have, th there should be a way to determine the sequence of those thoughts, because what is time? Time is just a philosophical mnemonic device we use to establish the sequence of events. If God's thoughts were, how do you say, in sequence, which I don't see how else could have been, then for God to be outside of time doesn't make sense, at least for me, for others maybe yes. One philosophical argument would count against you on that point of view, and that is if God is omniscient, 
then he knows everything simultaneously. He wouldn't need to think in sequences. Right. It's sort of like a, a parallel or a serial computer. Uh, computers do some things serial, serially. They do some things in parallel. God can think in parallel in his, from his eternal viewpoint. Yeah. Well, but I think we have to be very careful about this whole subject because I think the dogmatism is not appropriate. The fact of the matter is none of us are God. None of us even have the kind of acquaintance with God to be able to understand how God works. So I think we need to be extra careful about saying God has to do it this way or God has to do it that way because my philosophy says so. Um, there are interesting hints that he could do it this way. There are interesting hints that he could do it that way. Um, but I think we need to be very humble about our knowledge of God's abilities. Because the fact of the matter is none of us really knows for sure. Anyway, uh, next week we will, uh, we will go over... I'm still deciding. I, I was going to go over chapter 5 next, but I think that uh, it may be worthwhile to go over it since we're breaking it chapter 2 anyway. Uh, it may be worthwhile going over chapter 3 next and then coming back to 5 after we've done 3 and 4. Um, unfortunately, the book doesn't come off quite as well in chapter 3, and I think it's important for us to discuss that because uh, it has important lessons for us in how we deal with... Uh, uh, data that's a little confusing, uh, but um, we'll see what happens uh, next week.